Well, we're glad you're here with us this morning. A couple of quick reminders um, for us before we pray and begin. Um, this is, begin deacon nomination and committee nomination. There are sheets out there on the tables in the lobby. Uh, so make sure you pick those up and pray about it. If God is laying in your heart to nominate someone to be a deacon, uh, we'll be nominating four, selecting four deacons coming up. Uh, so make sure you take those and pray over those, as well as anybody, if you're interested in serving on a committee, uh, there is those forms out there as well on the two black tables that are out there in the lobby. So make sure you do that and get those in uh, by July 16th is when we need those in by. Also, next Saturday uh, at 8 o'clock, we'll be meeting back at the garden, uh, back behind the building in the back of our property uh, to help pick potatoes. Uh, that's our community garden. So if you know someone that you can benefit from by taking some potatoes, come pick some potatoes and take them to them and deliver them. It's a great way, to, again, to be the hands and feet of Christ and take and meeting um, not just a, 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 a hunger need, um, but also a spiritual need because you can take and you can pray for them and share the Lord with them. Uh, but we're just glad that you're here to worship this morning. Um, looking forward to, to what God is going to do in our hearts today as we uh, continue our study through the uh, 23rd Psalm together. And uh, so let me pray for us and we'll jump right into worship. Father, you're so good and we're so thankful to be gathered in this place this morning. Lord, I pray God in this moment, God, that you would work in our hearts God, that you would stir within us, Lord God. Help us to long to see you this morning, long to uh, commune with you, Father, to praise you this morning, Lord, to lift your name high, Father. Father, I pray, God, as we begin to sing your praises, God, that we would give, give you all the glory, God, that we would sing knowing that we have an audience of one this morning, and that is you, Lord, that we are singing songs to you, God, reminding us of your amazing grace, reminding us of what you've done for us, God. Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to gather as the church, to worship you today, Lord. Help us today to set everything else aside, Lord, and focus completely upon you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. Go ahead and get you to stand with us. We have an extra special treat for you today. We have some of our, you ready for this, young adults that are going to join us with us today. These are some... These are some great kids. I, well, I don't want to call you kids because you really are. Y'all know you're growing up. They'll, they'll, they'll be older than me before you know it. They'll be driving and all that good stuff. But this is a special day uh, for them. They're going to help us lead worship. Uh, just encourage them. What a great group. And uh, help us lift up Christ's name with them this morning. i 
Amen. I think it's good for us sometimes just to sit and reflect on what Christ has done with our lives. So many times in this life we can get busy with jobs and kids and school and business and everything that goes along. But to take notice and, and really let it sink in what Christ has done for us, to have the hope of eternal life, that should be very humbling to us. So continue to worship with us. special for you.
your Bible, if you take it out and turn to the 23rd Psalm with me this morning, the 23rd Psalm. Thank you so much for our praise team and our youth for leading us this morning. Uh, what a blessing it is to have them up here uh, with us this morning, uh, leading so well. Uh, the 23rd Psalm, last week we began our journey through this, and we kind of took an overview of the passage last week, and we begin today by diving down into each verse um, every, for the next several weeks. Um, I love this passage. I think it's a beautiful passage of Scripture. I think it's, in fact, I think it's one of the most well-known and most loved passages of Scripture in the Bible. Um, there are people all across the world who don't, who, not, who don't even know Jesus, but they know the 23rd Psalm because they've been to a funeral before and they've heard it. And they've heard it for whatever reason, but the 23rd Psalm is a well-known and loved passage of Scripture. I believe it's a word with power. I believe there is power in all of God's Word, but it's especially in the 23rd Psalm because this passage touches something deep within us as people, as followers of Christ. This passage describes the journey of life, but also in God's presence through all of life. It shows us this picture, and the 23rd Psalm is a, simple, is a single chapter of the Bible that, again, many of us know by heart. We could recite it out of the translation that we are used to, and we could recite it and know it, and we keep it, and we keep it in our heart. But for some, it, this is the only chapter they know in the Bible, right? The, the question comes to mind as I was studying this, as we think about this passage, is why do we love this passage so much? Why do we love the 23rd Psalm so much? Why do we reach for it in times of distress, but also in times of comfort, in times of need, but also in times of joy. Why do we think about this psalm? Why does it come to mind? Well, in just a few short lines, it truly conveys the wisdom that comes from knowing God. It helps us to be able to see the world in, in a somewhat less frightening way. Putting things in perspective. It helps us to deal with the loss of people that we love. It helps us to see tragedy and difficult, difficult times in view of that God is with us. And reminding us of that fact, it shows us that conflict with people that we struggle with or treat us wrongly, that God is there. 
that he is with us in those times. It shows us how to recognize God's presence at times and in places where you might think his presence is absent. It's a picture of reminding that God is always with us. That he is there. The words do not deny that difficulty will come. It reminds us, yes, difficulty will happen in your life. Believer or unbeliever, difficulty will happen because that's life. Or it doesn't minimize the pain that we experience, nor does it offer some simple pious hope. It points us to the true hope in Jesus. Right? If you're anxious, the psalm gives you courage. If you're going through a time of grieving, it offers comfort. If you're feeling worn down by life or whatever it is that you're facing, the psalm reminds you where your replenishment comes from. Each week, as we walk through this book together, we're going to read the entirety of the 23rd Psalm and then really dive into a passage each week of one specific verse to get the full understanding because there's so much here that we could spend multiple weeks on every verse. To really get the true depth and understanding. But today I want you to follow along with me as I read verses 1 through 6 of the 23rd Psalm. And then we're going to jump in this together on verse 1. God's word says this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path for his name's sake. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you take your words. You're infallible, your inerrant words, Lord, and speak into our hearts. Lord, the 23rd Psalm is a beautiful passage. It's your words. Help us this morning, Lord, to see what it means that you are our shepherd. And when you are our shepherd, there is nothing that we lack or nothing that we shall want. Father, speak as only you can, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're going to tackle verse 1 this morning, but before we do that, a question came to my mind this week as I was studying this passage, and maybe it's something you've thought of before um, when you've read the Bible and you've heard the the sheep and shepherd metaphor being used, is, is why does the Bible use shepherd and sheep, that metaphor, for Christ in the church? Why does he want to call us sheep? Right? Why does when he look at us, he sees nothing but a bunch of sheep? I've always found that interesting, um, except for when when I when I I don't have any sheep. We live on an old sheep farm, and my wife wants sheep, and I don't really want sheep after studying more about sheep. I'll just be honest with you. Um, I don't want sheep when I look at myself because I see um, what what a sheep really is in in the biblical terms and the mindset of the calling us sheep. My, My question goes to why doesn't he call us something better than a sheep? Right? Why does he call like like why do he call us like a lion? Right, or a bear, or a hawk, or a tiger, or something like that. But over 200 times throughout the Bible, we're referred to as sheep, or part of the flock. Now, when you think about sheep for a moment, I don't know if you've ever been around sheep or spent some time with sheep. I haven't. I've just read a lot about sheep, right? And so, what what we know about sheep is this: they're not very smart, right? Sheep are not very smart. They're very naive. They're not very discerning. So you see, the Bible calls us sheep. So really, if you're like me, you're not feeling very good about yourself at the moment, right? right? But what we see, there, there are three noted dangers that sheep face. The first one is that they're prone to wander. Sheep are prone to wander. They easily follow the crowd. They, 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 don't, they often don't recognize imminent danger right in front of them. So they're prone to wander. They follow the crowd. And they don't recognize the danger that's maybe right, right beside them or coming up on them. In fact, sometimes some shepherds will say that when a sheep sees danger, sometimes they will move towards it to kind of say, hey, what's going on over there? But how often does that describe us as people? That we are prone to wander. That we easily follow the crowd so that we don't stick out. That we don't look different. How we easily follow culture. How we often don't recognize the danger that's around us at all times. Very much like sheep. We constantly wander from God's truth. Even though we know God's truth, we still wander. 
We wander away. Uh, one of my favorite hymns is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. That hymn was written back in the 1700s. And these are the words that the, the, the man who wrote that, uh, that hymn said. He says, Jesus sought me when a stranger. Listen, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bond my wandering heart to thee. He continues, he says, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O taken, seal it, seal it for thy court, courts above. Even though we know Jesus, we know his word, we are still prone to wander. Sheep always need direction. They don't ever really know where they're going. They, they have a complete lack of awareness of their surroundings. That's why if they're left alone, they will wander right off a cliff. If one is not there, a shepherd is not there to bring them back. When a, when a sheep is lost, it will never, ever make its way back unless the shepherd pursues it. The shepherd is constantly having to go after his sheep. Isaiah 53, 6 says this, we all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own ways. As you study this picture, you see more and more of why that God references his church, his people as sheep. Because we are prone to wander. We are prone. We need direction. Because when we don't have the direction from above, we don't have the direction from the Lord, we are prone to go astray, to go right into the enemy's hands. Sheep are also needy. We are needy people. I'm a needy person. Ask my wife. She will tell you. I am very needy, right? We are needy. We are in constant need. Sheep are in constant need of food and water. Yes, you say that makes sense. But here's the thing. They can't find it on their own. They need the shepherd to lead them. Right? They are high maintenance livestock. Sheep are like Velcro. Think about this. If they go through a path, everything just sticks to them, right? Because they're, they have their, their wool that's all over them, right? If the shepherd doesn't come along and clean them and take care of them, they're just going to have everything and kind of everything's going to stick to them and they're going to go through life being weighed down. In fact, the sheep, if it falls over, it will, like a turtle, you know, a turtle, if a turtle gets left on its back, it cannot flip itself over. A sheep is the same because a sheep, if it flips over, it's, its body, if it, all of its wool sucks everything to it, it's like a sponge. It cannot get back up on its feet unless a shepherd comes along and helps it back up. How many times have you been on flat on your back? And God had to come and help you up. How many times have we been down in the dumps and God had to come and pick us back up and get us moving back in the right direction? Now, sheep also don't like it when they're getting sheared. They don't like to be sheared. They try to get away. And in those moments, they think the shepherd's being mean. Right? They, they want to get away from him. But shearing is essential to their future. Right? It's of their best entrance. Many, many times in our life, we don't like it when the good shepherd shears us when he comes in and he does something he takes something away he presents some pruning in our life and we think god why are you doing that but it's important for us it helps us to move forward sheep require major maintenance for instance there are insects that annoy sheep and in fact the shepherd has to come and put olive oil on the head of a sheep to keep the bugs from landing and nesting on the sheep the insects can lay their eggs literally in the sheep's eyes and cause it a painful, painful blindness to come over it. The shepherd must be in constant care of the sheep. As I've studied and, and walked through this and looked at this more and more throughout the last several weeks, leading up into this series, I've looked, I've looked at this and I see the perfect picture. Why does he use the metaphor of shepherd and sheep for Jesus and his church? It's because it makes sense. We are lost without the shepherd. We are lost without our shepherd. We are lost. The world will come in and lead us astray. Sin will come in and take over. The evil one will always cause us to go astray. And we need the shepherd to come and get us off the ground, off our backs when we fall flat on our backs. We need him to come and take us and put us into the green pastures. We need to come and take us and help us not to wander, to give us direction in our life. Do you know this, that sheep never outgrow their need for the shepherd? 
you, no matter where you're at in life, no matter what age you are, you will never outgrow your need for the shepherd. One day he will call you home and you'll get to sit at the feet of the shepherd and worship the shepherd. You will never outgrow your need for the shepherd. Sheep have no defense system. Literally, there's nothing they can do to protect themselves. They have no teeth, no claws, no camouflage. I mean, you ever pass the pasture full of sheep? Look like a big fl- bunch of fluffy marshmallows out there, doesn't it? If I'm a wolf or some, a fox or something, that's where I'm going, to the marshmallow field. Do you know what I mean? Right? The only defense that a sheep has is to stay close to the shepherd. Family, the only defense that we have against the evil one is to stay close to the shepherd. Amen. The only defense we have is to be close to the shepherd because that is where security is found. So when we think about this verse that the Lord is my shepherd, I hope that that picture of the sheep and the shepherd and why that metaphor is used, just kind of an overall glance at it gives you kind of even more understanding of the, of the passage of how the psalmist starts out that the Lord is my shepherd. It says, I shall not want. It's important to remind ourselves as we begin here, I believe that God is sovereign, right? When you think about the shepherd, when you think about God, it's important to first start off and remind ourselves that God is sovereign. Sovereign simply means that he has authority, that he has the supreme power, that he has, it's the, God has the right to exercise his power over his creation, that God is sovereign. The shepherd is sovereign. Verse one begins with the Lord. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. The Lord, our sovereign God. Now, that word, word Lord in your Bible is, is capitalized, right? All the letters of Lord is capitalized. It's in capital letters. This word for Lord is a translation of an Old Testament name for God. That is the most sacred name for God that the Jewish people had, and it's the word Jehovah. Now, every time you see the word Lord in all caps, it means Jehovah. Now, why is that important? Well, the name Jehovah was such a sacred name. It was the self-existing, the one who never had a beginning, the one who never has an ending, the great I am, a sacred name for the Lord. It's though in essence, it says Jehovah is my shepherd. That name was so sacred to the Jewish people that that some Bible historians say it was only pronounced one time a year when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and whisper the name Jehovah. The Jewish, the Jewish people never spoke that name audibly. When a Jewish scribe was translating the scriptures, when he would come to the word Jehovah, he would actually put down that pen and get out a brand new pen to write that name. Now, you have to understand what David is saying when he says, he says, Jehovah is my shepherd. And an evangelist by the name of Angel Martinez, I think, explains it pretty well. This is what he says. He says, the Lord, the one who made the world and everything in it, the one who lit the sun and put the stars in their places, that's my shepherd. The one who threw a carpet of green grass upon the earth and tacked it down with the flowers. The one who scooped up the valleys and piled up the hills. The one who took the song of the seraph and robed it with feathers and gave it to the nightingale. The one who took the rainbow and wove it into a scarf and threw it on the shoulders of a dying storm. That's my shepherd. At evening time, he pulls down the shade of the night and shoots it through the sunset with fire. That's my shepherd. That is the sovereign creator God. All-powerful God is our shepherd. The emphasis is there that the Lord who created all things is your shepherd. He is our shepherd. So when we look at verse 1 and we see that we are calling on the sovereign God, Jehovah, the great I Am, the one who rules the universe, who is all-powerful, almighty, is your shepherd. And the shepherd wants nothing more than to lead his sheep, to give them direction, to give them life, to meet the needs of the sheep, to care for them. The Bible says the shepherd will willingly lay down his life for the sheep. And we see that he did when he sent his son, Jesus. Jehovah, the I am, all powerful, almighty God is our shepherd. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at the significance of the shepherd. If we haven't seen it already, we'll see it some more because the Bible talks a lot about shepherds. In fact, we'll see throughout the scriptures, there are three references to shepherds that we really want to look at. One is the good shepherd. Two is the great shepherd. Three is the chief shepherd, all referenced throughout the scriptures. And we see this fulfillment, this picture. The the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. 
right? The Jehovah God sent his son Jesus for us. When we say Jehovah, we speak of his deity. But when we say shepherd, we speak of his humanity. We talked about this last week very briefly, but in John chapter 10, Jesus unlocks the, the mystery of the 23rd Psalm. When he says the words that I am the good shepherd, I am the good shepherd. You want to know the picture of the 23rd Psalm? It's the fulfillment is found in Jesus. He is the good shepherd. We have sovereignty and sympathy. Right? We have a king and a shepherd. Right? We have a God who is able and we have a shepherd who is available. Right? A God in the heavens and a shepherd in our hearts. So we see this picture, this, this threefold of, a, of, a, of, of, of the shepherd theme. Where's the good shepherd? Three times in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus is described as shepherd. He's described, first of all, again, as the good shepherd in John chapter 10. We just quoted that a minute ago. I am the good shepherd. D did you know this? That in this life, in this world, there's only been one person. One person throughout all of eternity who ever chose to die. Only one. No one has ever chosen to die but Jesus because he was the only one who didn't really have to die. Right? He didn't have to die. All of the rest of us are going to die sooner or later because, yes, there are some people who chose to die. They took their own life for whatever reason, right? Right? They chose it, but Jesus chose it, but he didn't have to. He wasn't going to die eventually, right? He was the, the, the perfect son of God. Some people have chosen to die a little sooner, but again, no one has chosen to die except one, and that was Jesus who chosenly chose to lay down his life for the sheep. He said, no man can take my life from me. No man can kill me. I lay it down. Church, it was, wasn't the nails that held him to that cross. It was the love and the bonds of redemption that held Jesus Christ to that cross. The good shepherd Jesus is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Now listen, when, when, when as the good shepherd, he laid down his life for the sheep, he, he dealt with the penalty of sin. Because we know the Bible also talks about sin, right? He talks about for the wages of sin is death, right? And that's what Jesus Christ was paying for. Your sin will be forgiven in Christ. You will be redeemed in Christ. Or you'll be punished in hell. If there is no redemption for you, if you haven't given your life to Jesus, but your sin will not be overlooked. Church, unless there's a good shepherd who has died for your sins, we are going to have to face the wrath of an angry God at the judgment time. But praise God, he is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep, who laid down his life. But we also see that he's the great shepherd, that he's the great shepherd, not only as he's shown as the good, but the great shepherd. Right? In Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21, we see him named the great shepherd. It says this, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean that, that brought again from the dead, that raised him that he's speaking of the resurrection. Now listen, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the through the blood of the everlasting covenant makes you perfect. That is meaning mature in every good work to do his will. He's called the great shepherd. He rose for the sheep. It speaks of the resurrection. Now it says now in Hebrews 13, 20, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd. What good is a dead shepherd? Think about this. He's no good at all except that he pays for the penalty of his sin. And we see him as the great shepherd because he, he defeats sin. He defeats death. He defeats the grave. When he rose from the dead, he's now dealing with the power of sin. The good shepherd deals with when dying for the sins. Now he's the great shepherd. He's dealing with the power of the sin. So he's not only the good shepherd, but he's the great shepherd. He's the great shepherd. And we also see that he's the chief shepherd. The Bible says he's been able to lead us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. We'll see that in verse 3 when we get there. So not just that he died for us, but that he lives for us. He lives for us. And that deals with the power of sin. He's also called the chief. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, just mark that down. 
First Peter five, chapter, chapter five, verse four says, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you will receive, you shall receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. And there you have the ministry of our Lord. As the good shepherd, he had to be good to do it. He, had to, he died for our sins. As the great shepherd, he had to be great to do it because he rose to take care of not only the penalty of our sin, but the power of our sin. And then as the chief shepherd, one day's coming, he's going to take us from the presence of sin. He's going to take us home. One day he's coming back. The church, the more that I read the Bible, the more that I read his word, the more that you look at the news, the more that you look at what's happening in our world, the closer I believe that we are to the day that he comes back. Amen. Some people will try to judge and say they know the day, the time, and the hour. The Bible says only God knows. But we do know is this, is that one day we're one day closer. Amen. And we must be ready. We must be ready for the day that he comes. I believe the chief shepherd is going to appear and he's going to call his sheep upward to be with him. You see, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is Jehovah, our shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. And the shepherd wants nothing more than to lead his sheep, to provide for his sheep, to take care of his sheep. He provided the ultimate sacrifice in his son, Jesus Christ. Giving us a way, guiding us in our direction, leading us to Him, leading us to come back to be with Him in glory. You know, one of the things that's so beautiful about the Bible is that there are little signs of, uh, that, that you find that are that, uh, of inspiration, that are really great signs when you see them. For, for example, we are studying the 23rd Psalm right now, but it would do us good to go back and read. We're not going to read it today, but to go back and read Psalm 22, but also Psalm 24. That trinity of psalms is so such a beautiful picture here because in Psalm 22, you find the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Psalm 22 is written as if a man were standing at the foot of the cross. Standing at the foot of the cross, the gambling for his garments, the words that he would say on the cross, the piercing of his hands and feet, the words of his enemies, all of that's found in Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, what do you see? The, the good shepherd dying for his sheep. In Psalm 23, what do we find? You find the great shepherd leading his sheep. The one who was alive, risen from the dead. And then in Psalm 24, we see the chief, the chief shepherd coming for his sheep. You see, in Psalm 24, this is the Lord coming, coming back. A beautiful picture. These three Psalms are a beautiful picture. You see the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. The good shepherd died to pay the penalty. The great shepherd rose to care for the power of the sin of the chief shepherd who was coming in to, in glory to take us away from the presence of sin. We see this picture, the significance of the shepherd, our need for the shepherd in our life. We need the shepherd more than we will ever realize. We need him to lead us, to guide us, to give us direction so that we don't suffer from those, those things we mentioned at the beginning. That there are the dangers of sheep being prone to wander. When we seek to follow the crowd instead of following Jesus. When we don't recognize the imminent danger that lies all around us. We need the shepherd. But the last part of this verse says the words, I shall not want. I shall not want. So what do we see in that passage? We see, we first we see the, the, the picture of the shepherd. Right? And, and the, the beauty of the shepherd. But then we also see the satisfaction is found in the shepherd. That satisfaction is found in the shepherd. He says, I shall not want. The, the CSB Bible that, that I use, it's actually the words are, I have what I need. Your translation may use something different. The same connotation is there. That in the shepherd, we have what we need. Our, we shall not want. When you have, uh, I think about in my life, I think about it Christmas time, one of the Christmas, I love Christmas time. Like I love everything about Christmas, um, except for now, it gets more expensive. Amen? Right? Right? And that's the part that we picture, right? That we get because, the, you know, one of the things that I think that, that, is, that is 
that I think now, I used to like it, but now as I've gotten more kids, I think it's from the devil, is all of those toy catalogs that come, right? Thank goodness they don't come as often as they used to. We used to get a ton of them from like every store. A lot of the stores are going out of business now. I don't like that, but at least I don't get any more toy catalogs from them, amen? Right? But they come because what happens, right? Your kids go through those and they circle everything they want, right? Everything they want. And it's like, in my case, I might as well just take the whole book and be like, here's, here's what we want, Dad, right? I mean, because we have these wants, right? And as people, we, we can put that on kids, but we do the same thing, right? I get the Bass Pro Shop catalog in the mail, and I can circle a lot of stuff I want, right? But ain't nothing of that I'm going to get, right? But we have all these wants, right? We want to be, and that, but then it goes another step, right? We want to be happy. We want to be fulfilled, right? We want to have a good life. We want to provide for our families. We want to move up in our jobs. We want to do this. We want to do that. You know what I found? When you get to that want and you actually achieve whatever that want is, like you want to get a raise, right? What happens when you get that raise? Then you want another raise, right? What happens when you're trying to lose weight, right? You set a goal for a weight loss, right? Okay, I want to lose 20 pounds, you get to that 20 pound mark, you're like, man, I could lose 20 more pounds. And you're never happy with it, right? That's what our wants do. When our want is found in something in the, of the world, we get to the point where we achieve that want or we get that want, and then we're not happy. Same thing goes with the kids at Christmas. I, it, it's one of the most, uh, I, again, I, I love Christmas. But then what happens at Christmas? Like you get your kids get all this stuff and we go like we go back home and they get all this stuff from grandparents, which is phenomenal and great. But then we bring it back home. You got to find a place to put it and then you find a place to put it. Then it breaks in the next day. But it was something they really wanted or they get it. And they lose it and they don't even remember it. It's like, man, you know how much that thing cost? Right? We, we, we have these wants that we think we need. They're going to bring some fulfillment. And how easy they can just slip away. Because we're not finding our satisfaction where our satisfaction needs to be found. Our, our, our satisfaction is not in stuff or places or things. Our satisfaction is in a person. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's the only way that anyone will ever find satisfaction in life. Find a fulfilled life, a happy life, a well-lived life as if you find satisfaction in the shepherd. If you are content in the shepherd... You will never, ever have satisfaction until you can say that the Lord is my shepherd and mean it. That you allow the shepherd to lead you, to guide you, even in a place that you may not really want to go to. A place that may not make much sense. Leading maybe to a job or a place in your life that you think, why in the world? God, no. You must let the shepherd lead. Only when you say that and live it, you can say, I shall not want. Because then you will find that satisfaction is found in the shepherd. Many people think that the secret of satisfaction is having a God that can give you everything. Church, that is not the secret to having satisfaction in God is him giving you everything. In fact, I believe just as parents, we don't give our children everything, right? Because it hurts them in the long run if you do. God doesn't give us everything we ask for. Why? Because he knows that some of the stuff we ask for would, would wind us up in trouble. Like, I will never win the lottery in my life. I can promise you that, right? I don't play the lottery, but if I did, I wouldn't win it because God knows what I would do with it. We can make the promise all day. Oh, I give, I tithe to every church in the county. But God says, yeah, I know what you do with the rest of it. Right? We, we, we just know that, right? Because we see that. We see that picture. The secret of satisfaction is found in the Lord himself, in Jehovah, in your shepherds. You see, your needs will never be met until they're met in him. Things will never satisfy you. There's another psalm that's very, maybe very familiar with you, Psalm 37. There's a very familiar passage in Psalm 37 that many people will claim. And they claim it out of context. They, this, this is what the passage says. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Many people claim that or say that that means to them that if, I, if, if I'm delighting myself in the Lord, he's going to give me what my heart desires. And listen, some people say my heart desires some more stuff. It's not what that's referring to. It's not what it's referring to. It's not anything that you can put, park in your driveway or add into your bank account. That's not what this is referring to, right? That isn't what it means. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desire of your heart. Well, what does that mean? It simply means this, is that when you delight in the Lord... 
That the deepest needs of your heart will finally be met. And you'll be able to say, I shall not want. Because your needs will be met in Jesus. The desire of your heart is Jesus. That is what your heart is yearning for. Right? That's what you were made for, for him. The Bible says that it is in him that we live and move and have our being in him. You will never be satisfied apart from the shepherd. You will always be searching for something more and more and more. Until you can say the Lord is my shepherd. It's not about what he gives, but it's about him. And allowing him to lead you and guide you. Think about this. What did God make a fish to do? To swim in water, right? What did God make a bird to do? To fly in the sky. Now, if you take a fish out of the sea and put him up in a tree, he's going to be pretty unhappy. Amen? You take a bird and put him in the water, unhappy. Why? Because they're both out of their element. Let me ask you this. What is the element that you were created for? God himself. You were created in his image to worship and glorify him with all of our life. But how many of us actually do that? How many times do we actually worship and glorify him when instead we're actually worshiping and glorifying ourselves? Self-promotion, self-love, that's what our world teaches us. That's what the culture teaches us. But the Bible teaches us it's about the Lord. Dying to self. Coming alive in Christ. Living for him. Walking daily in a relationship with the Lord is the source of blessings that overflows in abundance. If you are searching today, seeking to find that next, that next thing that's going to bring you fulfillment, that next thing that's going to bring you joy, stop searching and start looking at Him. Looking at the shepherd. I'm not saying it's not good if you have wants or something. That's great, but they can't bring your satisfaction. Don't seek satisfaction in something you can buy with your money or a place you can travel to or something in your life that can be added to it that will bring you satisfaction because you'll never find it unless you're looking at the shepherd. That's where your satisfaction comes from. That's where true satisfaction, true fulfillment comes. Because why? Because of this. Because not only were you made for him, but when you go through life, and as we go through this passage, we'll see later, right? That even in the darkest valleys, the shadow of death, if your fulfillment's not found in the shepherd, you're going to struggle. If your fulfillment's not found in the shepherd, when you go through difficulties in life, you're going to search for it in all the wrong places. I've said this in just about every, every funeral service I've ever done, that grief Times of sorrow and pain, trouble will will cause you to do one of two things. One of two things every time. It will either cause you to run from God or run to God. That's not rocket science. That's just truth. Right? How do we know the difference? Right? Here's the difference maker. Whether you're going to run from God or you're going to run to God. Is he your shepherd? Do you find satisfaction in him? Because if you do, then you know that not only in the good times he's there, but in the bad times, in the darkest valleys, he's there. And just like the sheep, when they get scared, the shepherd is there to bring them into his fold, to bring them into into him, right? To help them, protect them from the enemies, to protect them from the storms, right? To be there with them in the midst of the storm that they're facing. So many of us want to run to something else when we really just need to turn and run to Jesus. The shepherd, David's assurance That every need of his life would be supplied was not hinging upon his abundance or his riches or his greatness or his ability to achieve, but solely on the principle that he belonged to the shepherd, to the Lord. Let me ask you this this morning. Is the Lord your shepherd? Is he your shepherd? How do you know? I want to give you a clue. If you haven't figured it out already, this is this is this is this is the clue. The only way that you can say the Lord is my shepherd is for you to be able to say this, that the shepherd is my Lord, that the shepherd is my Lord. Not everybody can just stand up again and quote the 23rd Psalm and claim it for their own. Is the shepherd the Lord of your life? 
Many of us, we want Jesus and what he can offer, right? Salvation and everlasting life, but we don't want him to be Lord of our life. Because when he's Lord of our life, guess what? We have to submit. And there's really no separating the two. Many people think that we can just follow Jesus and get that ticket to heaven and, 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 and that, that claim that we're going to be in heaven. But we don't want to actually surrender him as Lord. Listen, you must surrender to the shepherd. For him to be your shepherd, he also has to be your Lord. Is Jesus truly the Lord of your life? Are you satisfied in the shepherd this morning? Are you content with your life? Content with whatever it is that God has given you? Listen, for many of us, we will be content when the next thing comes. But let me ask you this. If nothing else, if God didn't answer any more prayers in your life, if he didn't do anything else for you in your life, except for what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross, would you still be content in him? If he's your shepherd, the answer would be yes. Because Jesus is enough. He is enough. There are things around us trying to steal our contentment in Christ. Envy, perfectionism, right? people pleasing, greed, pride, ego, busyness, culture. Where's your contentment found? Is it found in the shepherd? Can you say with the psalmist, with, with David, that I have what I need in the shepherd? That I shall not want because I have the shepherd. Do you want your shepherd more than anything else? David wrote in Psalm 34.10 that young, young lions lack food and go hungry, but those who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Now, I love this paraphrase that I found of Psalm 23 verse 1. This someone putting it in their own words. This is what they said. Lord, I am willing to receive whatever you give. I'm willing to lack whatever you choose to withhold. And I'm willing to relinquish whatever you choose to take. Because you are my shepherd. And I trust you. And I follow you. This morning as we come to a time of response. And a time where we prepare for the table. Let me ask you again. Is the Lord your shepherd? Maybe you're here this morning. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So he is not your shepherd. My prayer for you is today that would be the day where you say yes. And you give your life to Jesus. You repent of your sins. You ask for forgiveness for him to come and to be the Lord of your life, to be your shepherd. This morning, if you are here this morning and you are, you are seeking, you, maybe you've wandered from the truth. Maybe you've fallen prey to the things of this world and it's pulling you. Pulling your family apart. Pulling your relationships apart in your life. This morning, maybe you need to come and pray and say, Lord, I've wandered. You know, the thing about a shepherd is when one of his sheep wander, he will leave the pack, the herd to go after the one that wanders. Do you know this morning, if you have wandered, he has not stopped pursuing you since the day you wandered from him because he is a good shepherd. He's not just good. He's the great. He is the chief shepherd. Have you wandered this morning? It may be affecting your family, your job, everything else in your life. This morning, come and Lord, say, Lord, I know that you're pursuing me. Help me to come back into the fold. Help me, Lord, to be led by the shepherd. Help me, Father, this morning. This morning, you may have unconfessed sin in your heart. The Bible says that we cannot come before the table with unconfessed sin in our heart, without a pure heart. Is there something in your life that you need to confess this morning? And I beg of you to please come. To come to the altar and pray and confess it to the Lord. Confess it to him. Ask him for forgiveness. So that as we partake in one of the most important things that we do as a body of believers, partaking of the observance of the Lord's Supper, of the body and the blood of Christ, that we come together as with pure hearts before him, reminded of who he is and what he has done. Father, in this moment, Lord, we pray. And I ask, God, that you would help us to respond to your word. God, that you help us respond to you this morning, Lord God, and be reminded, God, that you are the great shepherd, that you are our shepherd that wants to lead us, God, that, that laid his life down for us, Lord. And if there's someone here who's struggling, Lord, remind them that the shepherd is there. Father, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as shepherd, as the shepherd, as Savior, as Lord, and I pray that today 
is the day where they finally say yes. Jesus, I pray, God, that if there's someone here who's wandered, if they would come, Lord, and be reminded, God, that you are pursuing them, that you love them. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we can come and respond to your word and prepare our hearts to take the Lord's Supper together. Help us if there is unconfessed sin in our heart today, Lord, in this moment, Lord, to confess it to you. To cleanse our hearts today, Lord. Father, speak and move as only you can. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Church, would you stand and sing this morning? God, you are so good. Let's sing together. Jesus, we thank you for the blood. We thank you, God, that because of the blood that was shed on our behalf, God, we can be free from the penalty of sin. That the blood, because of the blood that was shed, we can be washed white as snow. Lord, we don't deserve it. We can't earn it. But you gave it. And we thank you, God. 
Thank you for the gift. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for loving us so much that you would lay down your life. And Lord, if there is one here today that was not able to partake this morning because they don't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that today is a reminder. We don't know the day, the hour, the moment that you will come back or the day you will call us home. But we know that day is coming. And we need to be ready. And the only way to be ready is to give our life to you. To trust you, Lord. Surrender ourselves to your Lordship. To surrender ourselves. Forget, ask for forgiveness of our sins, Lord. And Father, I pray that today is an awakening, a wake-up call for some. If they don't know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, help us to do as we leave in a moment, Lord. Just as your word says, for as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup to proclaim your death until we, you come back. Father, help us as a church family to leave this place today. As we go our separate ways to proclaim your death and resurrection and the life-giving power that's found in the blood of Jesus. Until the day you call us home or the day you come back. Father, go with us now as we leave. For it's in Jesus' most precious name that we pray. Amen. God bless you, church family. You are dismissed. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.